All right, so I think we'll begin. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Um, I'd like to introduce myself and welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on the formula of B2B negotiation strategy. Uh, this webinar is uh, one of a series of webinars addressing topics aligned with the School of Professional Studies Master's of Science program in negotiation and conflict resolution. My name is Andrew Hummer. I'm an advisor at the School of Professional Studies, and I will be facilitating some of our conversations today. Um, if you're able to hear me, please type yes into the Q&A box. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we can hear all of the presenters loud and clear um, before we dive in. All right, perfect. Um, while everyone is typing yes to confirm audio, I do have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, I encourage you to utilize the Q&A function as you develop questions during the presentation. Um, at the end of today's session, we will be addressing some of those questions um, that you share. Uh, we will not be using the chat box function for this webinar, so please let us know of any questions via the Q&A. Um, I would also like to share uh, with the group that today's session is being recorded and will be made available for you for your convenience. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome today's presenter. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Fis Beth, Beth Fisher Yoshida, uh, Academic Director for the Masters of Science in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program. Hi, Beth. How are you doing today? Fine. Thanks, Andy. Thank you for the introduction. I'm also going to introduce Mark Raffin, who is the main presenter today. And uh, Mark, would like to just say hello? Hello. <laughs> Great. Mark will do a little bit more about who he is as we go forward, but I just want to set the context a little bit. Um, I met Mark maybe a year ago, or a little less than a year, maybe a year ago, I can't remember. And um, Mark does something called the Ninja Negotiation Ninja Podcast, and I had the pleasure of being on one of the podcasts with Mark. And he has a lot of a background in procurement. And I thought that um, with Mark's experience, uh, he's a lot of it in Canada, but also in the US and probably other places in the world he'll tell about, that it would be an interesting, uh, let's say, interesting angle on negotiation to speak from his experiences in the B2B world and especially with procurement and other areas. And so for the NECR program and for students interested or people interested in the program, and people who graduated the program, one, um, a couple of the areas that students focus on that I think this would be particularly relevant for are people who are interested in starting their own businesses or who maybe have started their own businesses and are running them. So people with an entrepreneurial spirit and who are constantly engaged in one form of negotiation or another. It could be internally, but a lot of times they are externally dealing with vendors who they have to buy supplies from, or maybe they are a vendor and they're dealing with clients or you know, on a variety of levels, which I think a lot of what Mark is gonna talk about today is very relevant to that population. Another population that we seem to have a lot of students from are from family businesses. And in family businesses, there are a couple of different levels of dynamics that happen there. Separate from the business, of course, there are the whole family or interpersonal dynamics even though sometimes people say that they're separate, I have a hard time completely believing that, but anyway. And then from that family business perspective, when you have younger generations moving into more senior leadership in those family businesses, they may continue on with exactly what the family business has been doing, but they may also alter it because the nature of business and the environment is changing over the years. So they may have different kinds of insights and they benefit a lot from the negotiation skills we can cover here in order to make those changes as smoothly as possible. So that's just some of the context. But then again, there's the whole broader field of negotiation in total. And no matter what kind of negotiation you engage in, I believe that there are some basic principles and practices which can be applied in any context. It just means that your negotiating counterpart or the context and the actual substance of the negotiation may differ. But as I said, there are some basic principles and practices. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. And I just wanna say that Mark will present. And then um, as Andy mentioned, please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will make sure that we have a substantial amount of time towards the end, like the last 15 or 20 minutes of the hour to deal with some of your questions, start addressing them and having a conversation there. So we encourage your participation as much as possible. So now I'll turn it over to Mark. 
Thank you very much, Beth. I really appreciate that. And hello to everyone who is joining us on the interwebs. It's certainly a, pr a pleasure to have all of you join. And thank you so much to Andy for setting this all up. I really appreciate that as well. Uh, as Beth mentioned, today I'm going to be talking to you about the formula of B2B negotiation strategy. And uh, Beth touched on a couple of things that uh, are really, really interesting to me, at least. One of the things that you'll find in most B2B negotiations, regardless of what area you're in, whether you're on the sales side, the procurement side, if you're an M&A, if you're trying to sell a company, if you're trying to negotiate internally, the processes and procedures remain essentially the same. The language that you use may change because of course everyone has different needs and different wants in negotiation. And that's great, but the process remains essentially the same. And so today I'm going to take you through a disciplined formulaic structure to negotiation strategy within business to business transactions, regardless of what they are. Um, all of the information that I'm going to be taking you through today is based on my research and some of the works that I've read, obviously, as well as some of the work that's been done um, at Harvard, uh, at the program on negotiation uh, with, uh, in concert with MIT, which is a fantastic program. What you may know as well, um, if you're already listening to this, is that Columbia University's uh, MS in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution is one of the top master's degree programs in negotiation in the world. Um, which is fantastic. So if you're all listening in on this and you're thinking to yourself, man, I really want to take part in something that uh, makes sense for my development as a negotiation professional, I highly recommend that you check out Columbia University. Uh, anything that Beth gets involved in is usually 100% awesome. So you should check that out. Okay, so today we're going to be discussing B2B negotiation strategy, and our agenda is going to be as follows. We'll get into research and development, basically to try and understand what it is you actually need and what it is you're willing to give up, and that's going to make more sense as this process develops. Then we'll get into framework development, which is all about developing a structure for your negotiations so that you don't make stupid decisions, because a lot, oftentimes we get involved in the emotion of a negotiation and we get caught up with the deal itself and we don't often take a step back and view the deal from the outside in. So the framework is there to help you to make better decisions and to help you to stop making stupid decisions. Then we'll get into understanding BATNA or best alternative to a negotiated agreement as academics call it. Essentially, it's just your plan B or understanding what your options are. And then we'll get into the importance of role playing, which I think is one of the most fundamental aspects of negotiation training that most people forget about. So research and development is essentially about understanding what you need and what you want. As shocking as it may sound, most people go into negotiations having no idea what it is they actually need and what it is they want. And now needs and wants are very different, right? So needs are things that you must have in a deal, things that are required to get the deal done, and wants are things that are nice to have things that would sort of be the cherry on top. So when you go into a negotiation with another party, whether you're on the sales side or the procurement side, or regardless of what you're doing in B2B transactions, the very first thing that you should know is what you need. And if you say, yeah, I want to make more money or I need to make more money, that's great. How are you going to do that? Is it through a negotiation on a price increase? Are you trying to negotiate an increase in volume? Are you trying to negotiate a decrease in risk? Is this a new market that you're trying to enter into? Are you trying to divest of an asset that your business no longer needs? So you really need to understand what it is you need and get specific. Don't be afraid to be very specific about what it is you need. And if you're saying to yourself, well, I, I need a better price, what is that better price for the product? So for example, if your price that you're selling something for was $100 
and you want to increase that price through a negotiation to $120, then that is the specificity that you would need in that negotiation. And bear in mind that when you're going into a negotiation, all of this stuff exists within a range, which we will get into when we discuss the framework. But when you ask for something in a negotiation and someone says no, where do you go to from there? And we'll discuss that in a little bit more depth once we get into the framework. Once you understand what you need and what you want, probably one of the most important things you can do is start to prioritize your needs and wants. And so if you have a list of needs, let's just say, for example, you have five to 10 needs that you want to get out of the negotiation. What is the most important thing to you in that negotiation? And if you were going to wait that item, meaning it has more weight to the decision than the other items, how would you weight it in your decision framework? Because ultimately negotiation is also about making better decisions, right? And your decision quality is incredibly important when you're dealing with something as, um, as intense as money. When you're thinking about the amount of money that you may be dealing with in the future, decision quality becomes incredibly important. And so if you're going to place a weight of importance on any one of those needs, you need to determine which is the most important. So for example, if it was to increase price or decrease price, for example, if you're on the procurement side um, and that was the most important thing to you, then that may have a weight of 60% of all of your needs or wants. Regardless of what the weight is, you're going to have to determine what the most important thing to you is to get from that negotiation. So once you've created your list, you're going to prioritize it, and then you're going to go and try and understand the market and the company and the person that you're going to be negotiating with. Because the market that you're going to be negotiating within, you need to fully understand everything you can about that market. So for example, if you're entering into a commodity-based industry, let's just say, for example, it's oil or gas, or if you're going to be um, trading futures or you're going to be selling a business within a specific market, it doesn't really matter what the market is. You just really need to understand the market that you're playing in and the market factors that are involved. Because if it's commodity based, for example, there's a lot of things in that negotiation that are going to be outside of your control. For example, the commodity pricing is generally outside of your control unless you're George Soros and you can dictate the price of commodities across the world, which hopefully some of you are, but if you're not, then you're going to have to try and figure out how to operate within that market and negotiate with the commodity prices at hand so you can attach prices to indices or whatever you need to do to try and maintain and manage your risk appropriately. Then you're going to need to understand the company that you're going to be negotiating with. So if your counterparty is from another company, if they're not internal, what is it that you can learn about that company? Obviously, the first place that you're going to go and look is Google. So you're going to go into Google. You're going to try and understand as best you can the financials, any kind of publicly available financial information that that company has published. You are going to go into it, understand all of the annual reports, understand any public statements that the executives and the leadership have made about goals, capital projects, operational expenses, that that company is making so that you can better understand what the goals of that organization may be in the general macroeconomic sense of it outside of your actual negotiation that you're taking place in. Then you're going to try and understand the person that you're going to be negotiating with. And that's easier said than done. Whenever you're trying to understand the market and the company, it's significantly easier to understand those things because you can get, generally speaking, you can get unbiased third party information on those items. Whereas the person comes with its own intricacies or his or, or her own intricacies. The easiest way to try and understand a person is to ask them 
questions. And so something that I'm going to teach you about right now is something called the question funnel. Open-ended questions, hopefully everyone on this line understands what an open-ended question is. It's basically a question that doesn't end in a yes or a no. So for example, if I had to ask you, do you like to read? And you said yes, that would be a closed question. An open-ended question would be, how do you feel about reading? And so what that does is that opens the conversation and generates conversations so that you can get the other party to start talking. Your job as a good negotiator is to get the other party to talk and to get them to keep talking and guide the conversation into areas where you think you can develop and extract value in business to business negotiations. And so if you're going to generate discussion, one of the open-ended questions you may ask is, how do you feel about the impact of a specific commodity on your business? Why do you feel that way? Perhaps you can expand on that for me and tell me more about those things. Those are probing questions. So once you have an open-ended question or a list of open-ended questions that you can ask someone and you ask those questions, the answers will, that you'll start to hear, and you're not going to be able to predict the response, but the answers that you will start to hear will start to generate thoughts in your mind that will help you to try and ask probing questions because an open-ended answer will start to generate areas where you can investigate further to try and develop and extract more value. So if that person had to say something along the lines of uh, meeting a need or a want that you had already developed, remember we came into this with our list of our needs and wants, and that person gave you an answer to an open-ended question that somehow matched to a need or a want that you had, then you could ask them a probing question to further understand how it may relate to your business or the negotiation at hand. So if the person had to say something, then you could ask a probing question of, tell me more about that. I'd like to understand where you may have experienced similar, similar problems or challenges or opportunities in other parts of your business. Do you have any suppliers that help you with those problems? Have you experienced sales challenges in each of these verticals? It's a fairly simple formulaic process that just helps you to try and understand the person and the business in more depth. And so if you can understand what the person wants and needs on the other side of the table and how what their company can provide to you in relation to your needs and wants, you can get to a better understanding of whether or not there's actually a deal to be had. Then once you've asked a bunch of probing questions and you get to a situation where you think you can close that line of questioning and move into an area where you can get to a deal done, you, if you're a salesperson, you may ask a question like, and if we can meet your needs around these challenges or opportunities, would it make more sense for us to have a follow-up conversation to perhaps get some sort of memorandum of understanding in place? Yes or no? That's a closed question. And so from that, you can close that line of questioning and move into an area where you can actually get a deal done. The key, of course, to all of this is to listen. Everyone talks about the value of listening in negotiation, but no one actually teaches you how to listen. And so what I want you to start thinking about whenever someone's talking to you and you're in a discussion with someone um, or a negotiation, regardless of what it is, is to stop thinking about your next question. Focus on what the person is saying to you and what they are not saying to you. So if you've asked a specific question and they haven't answered the specific question, there is something that they are not saying to you. And oftentimes that's equally, if not more important than what they are saying to you. Write those things down. Become a student of writing good notes because you're going to forget in the moment and you're going to forget in the negotiation and it's critically important to summarize the negotiation as you go along and what people say listen to what is being said and what is not being said then you know what i'm going to skip target outcome development we're going to go straight into 
what I call the six golden questions. So if you're going to be going into a negotiation with someone, these are basically the questions that I consider to be the six golden questions of any business negotiation. Number one, who is the decision maker? Are you actually negotiating with someone who can make a decision? Or do they have significant influence over the decision being made? Number two, when do you need a decision made by? And number three, which is a very different question, is when does a solution need to be in place? Sometimes people get these two things confused. When does a decision need to be made by and when does a solution need to be in place are two different questions. The agreement may be executed in three months, but a solution may only need to be in place in six months, for example. So you may actually have more time than you think. And time in a business negotiation can be your worst enemy or your best friend. So it's very, very, very important to understand the amount of time that you actually have to make a decision in a negotiation. The question at the bottom, which is who doesn't want this to happen, I consider probably the most important question to understand. You're going to piss people off and you're going to make decisions and you're going to create agreements that cause people unrest and make them angry. And there are going to be people that don't want things to happen. When you're in the negotiating process, it is critical at the beginning of that process to try your very best to understand who doesn't want the deal to happen. You may be replacing an incumbent service provider, for example, and that incumbent service provider has relationships in the business that you're selling to. And those relationships may have been there for generations. There are going to be people that don't want that relationship to go away. Your job is to identify who those people are so that you can effectively turn them over to your side. But you can't do that unless you know who they are, which is why we have that question there. Then the fifth question is, what happens if you don't make a decision? Not making a decision is a decision. A lot of people don't realize that there is a cost and a risk to not making a decision. And you need to understand from their perspective what the cost and risk is to not making that decision so that if you want to turn them in your favor, you emphasize the cost and risk of not making a decision in your favor. So that's a way you can condition the other party to believe that not making a decision in your favor is a terrible decision. And then ultimately, you need to know how much money is available. It's a very difficult answer to get. Sometimes people don't give away that number. But it shouldn't stop you from asking it, and it shouldn't stop you from asking multiple people those questions. Okay, let me get back to target outcome development. Target outcome development is critical. And when I say target outcome, you, you must have a target in mind when you're going into a business negotiation. There's obvi obviously a most likely point where you're going to end up in the negotiation. What is your target? Now, that's not your best case scenario. And it's also not your worst case scenario, whereas academics would call it your reservation point, the point where you walk away from the deal. So you've got to have something in mind where you think you're most likely to end up. And last but not least, in research and development, you have to understand what you're willing to give up. Um, for a lot of people, this is actually really difficult because we don't go into a, a negotiation thinking we're going to give up anything. But you're going to give up a lot more if you don't plan for it than if you had planned for it. So understanding what you're willing to give up and being objective about it is very, very important throughout the entire negotiation because if you don't plan it and you don't understand how much something actually costs when you give it away, you could be giving away something that's significantly more valuable than you think it is or the other way around. You could be giving away something that's less valuable than what you think it is and getting something that in return, that is worth nothing. You should never give away anything in a business negotiation unless you are receiving something of equal or greater value in return. People often talk about compromise being fair. Compromise sucks. Compromise is the worst thing ever. 
The definition of compromise means that two parties make a concession on a specific point to move the agreement forward. And how much sense does that make? That doesn't make any sense at all. So if you're going to give something away, make sure that you get something else in return for it. Because if you're not going to get something in return for it, then you've basically just made a concession with, with no value attached to it. And you could be giving away something that's incredibly important to making the deal work. Okay. Let me get off my soapbox real quick. Moving on. Framework development. Framework development is what's going to create discipline in your process. Basically, it, it causes you to slow down which is really, really important. So remember earlier on, I said you need to understand what your needs and wants are. And now we have a column for that. So prioritize needs and wants in the left-hand column. Your worst case scenario, oh, spelling error. Look at that. Your worst case scenario is your reservation point. If, if you've been in negotiation uh, academia for a while, you understand that your reservation point is the point where you need to walk away. So what is your walk away point in the negotiation? You must have a very clear understanding of walking away. That's your biggest point of leverage in the negotiation that coupled with your BATNA, of course, which we'll get to in a second. Your target outcome is what we discussed earlier, which is the most likely points in the negotiation where you think the negotiation is going to end up. And then the best case scenario is the, most realistic best case scenario. And I don't want everyone to think like, you know, best case scenario, I want a golden toilet seat or, or let's negotiate your pet into this deal. That doesn't make any sense at all. Obviously it has to be something that's realistic within the sense of the actual negotiation taking place. The reason that we put this framework together is because we've all been guilty of shooting too high or too low in negotiations. And what this does is it creates a framework for us to negotiate within. Remember earlier on I said negotiation is the operation of trading within ranges. So your worst case scenario, your reservation point is the low end of that range. And your best case scenario is the high end of that range. Anything that you negotiate within that range is a deal. So I want you to stop thinking about negotiation in terms of I got a good deal or a bad deal. If you're operating within the framework and you get something that makes sense within the riverbanks, basically your low end and your high end that you've created, then that is a good deal because you haven't made a decision that basically forces the company to lose money, which is lower than your reservation point. And you haven't gotten into a situation where you're trying to be greedy higher than your best case scenario. And you're taking money out of the pockets of the person that you're actually negotiating with. So you're making a deal that makes sense throughout this entire process though, you should be doing exactly the same thing for yourself within this framework for the other party as well, which means if you're going to develop a framework of needs and wants, best case scenario, worst case scenario, all that fun stuff for yourself, you should also be making a best guess attempt at what the other party needs and wants and what their worst target and best case scenarios are. And that's really, really important. And through open-ended questions, probing questions, and closed questions, you can validate whether or not your assumptions on their needs and wants are actually correct. And what you will find if you do a side-by-side -side view of your needs and wants and their needs and wants, as well as their best and worst case scenarios and yours, you'll see an overlap between a lot of the items that you have. And that overlap is what academics call the zone of possible agreement or the ZOPA. And that zone of possible agreement is where deals get done. That's where deals start to happen. That's why it's so important to try and understand the other party's perspective and what their needs and wants are. Because if you don't have an understanding of where the ZOPA may be, then you're not going to be able to make a deal work and make it make sense. Ultimately, though, your negotiation is only as strong as the options that you have going into it uh, or... Uh, as our friends in academia would call it, the BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, uh, which is essentially your plan B, right? So what's plan B? If things really don't go well in this negotiation, where do I go to from here? A good negotiator on the other side of the table is going to try and manipulate and minimize 
your options throughout the entire negotiation. Don't get offended by it. It's their job. That's what they have to do to make you believe that you're not all that, that you're not everything you think you're cracked up to be. The key here is to remember that your BATNA should only ever be influenced by fact and figures, never by conjecture or opinion. As the negotiating party on the other side of the table, it's my job to have opinions and conjecture about what I think this negotiation should be about, what I think the competition should be about, what I think you should be about, and how important I am to making you realize your goals. If I can condition you to believe that I'm significantly more important than I actually am, and if I can condition you to believe that you're less important than you actually are, and that there's lots of competition and I actually don't need you, then all of a sudden you become more desperate to make the deal with me because I am raising my perceived value in your eyes and I am lowering your perceived value in your own mind. And if I can do that, which is actually a lot easier to do than you may think, because I can use my opinion and my conjecture to shape your perception, then you will very readily give me more than you should, which is why your BATNA should only be ever influenced by facts and figures. And if I give you an opinion, it doesn't mean that you need to ignore those opinions. It means that you need to verify whether or not they are correct. Because if you verify that they are correct, then that becomes a fact. And then that does need to affect where you currently sit in the negotiation. But if it cannot be verified, then you need to toss it out as anecdotal and try your very best to ignore it. Role playing which is essentially the last part of our discussion here before we'll get into some Q&A. So role playing is critically important and most people don't role play a negotiation before they actually go into the negotiation, which is sad because how do you know what you're going to say if you actually don't practice saying it? How do you know how you're going to say it if you don't practice it? And how do you know when you should say it if you don't practice it. Timing is critical. There's a reason it's called the question funnel and not the question triangle pyramid. Because if you started asking closed questions first, the conversation would stop very quickly and your timing for your questions and your negotiations would be thrown off completely, which is why we ask open-ended questions first and then probing questions and then closed questions. Ultimately, the biggest question that we want to answer, though, behind role-playing, behind what, how, and when, is why. Why are we saying what we're saying? Why are we saying it that way? And then why are we saying it at that time? The question becomes, what response are we trying to elicit from the other party by saying those things in those ways? Only through role-playing with people in our organizations can we truly understand whether or not our questions and our statements are going to be effective. Because if you go in thinking that you're going to knock the negotiation out of the park and you're going to get everything that you wanted to get and your timing's off and what you're saying is, um, is nonsense and how you say it is terrible because your intonation on the questions is totally wrong and your confidence is bad, then you're not going to get what you want or need out of that negotiation because essentially what you're doing is you're painting yourself into a corner because you haven't practiced. Practice is critically important when it comes to negotiation. Negotiation is a skill. Like every skill, it requires practice for you to get better. And if you're not going to practice, you will not get better, which is why it's important to role play. So in conclusion, you need to know what you need, which are your must haves and want, which are your nice to haves. Without knowing what you actually need from the negotiation, you will not get something that requires the deal to be done. You need to know what you're willing to give up. So what are your concession items? What are you actually willing to give up? And objectively, what are the costs of those concessions? 
So if there is a concession that you need to make on a limitation of liability within an agreement, what is the cost of that concession of that liability, right? If you're going to take on more risk in that deal, what does that risk actually cost? And if you're going to give that away, if you're going to take on that risk, then you had better be getting something of equal or greater value in return. Otherwise, that concession does not make sense. Then build a roadmap, right? We went through the framework. You're, you have to have a reservation point. What is the point you're willing to walk away? You have to have a high end because you don't want to seem too greedy. And we could get into an entire discussion about bracketing and how, how much is too much when you ask for things. We, won't, we don't have time for that today, but know what it is you're, you're operating within. What's your low end? What's your high end? And then any deal made within that based on your needs and wants is going to be a deal. Know your BATNA. What is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? What is your plan B? You should be putting in as much work into your BATNA as you are into your actual negotiation, especially if it's a time bound project. Because if you get to a point where the deal with your primary negotiating party isn't going to work and you have to move to your BATNA and you've got to start from square one on understanding the needs and wants of the other party again, you're going to be in a position that doesn't allow you to make a good deal based on the timelines that you have. And then ultimately, which is the most important point here, is practice, practice, practice. Practice is the mother of all skill. The more you practice, the better you're going to get a get in everything that you do, not just negotiation. Because negotiation is a skill, it requires practice, which is why you're all here today, because you're either in the master's program or you're thinking of going into the master's program. So I don't need to convince you on the benefits of studying more about negotiation. The key here is to practice. You can read as much as you want. I could teach you as much as you want. Beth could show you everything you need to do. But if you actually don't implement any of the stuff, it's useless. You've wasted your time and you've wasted your money. So practice, practice, practice in everything that you do. That concludes our chat for today. Uh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. I've thank kept you for a very long time, but I'm sure there's some questions. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I wanted to reflect on a couple of things that you said first, and then we can, I see we have at least a few questions in the chat box, in the Q&A box. So um, when you showed the uh, six golden questions, what it prompted yes. to me too is that we prepare for a negotiation, hopefully, right? Because some people use the strategy of winging it, which I always say is not a strategy. Yeah. So you prepare for a negotiation, you try to find out as much information as you can. But the reality is that for me, my point of view is during the course of the negotiation, what you're also doing is trying to gain as much information as you can, because you go in there with a set of assumptions, you go yes. in there with what you think is the situation, but you don't actually know. And I was just thinking about some examples that, you know, even working with clients, right? So I go in and trying to close a deal with a client, what the unknown is, and a lot of times a big unknown is, is that person really the decision maker as you talked about? And then I've had situations where the person who I'm speaking with really does not have the authority to do what they say they're doing. And in some situations I've been in, that person ends up leaving the organization. So really has unknown information to me knows information that they may be can't disclose, but I'm there with a certain kind of intention and they're there with a different kind of intention because they're not really going to be there. So what I always say is since we don't know the bigger context, like you're talking about, sometimes they have an incumbent vendor or somebody there who's already been servicing that particular organization. And too often, sometimes like RFPs go out and then what happens is the RFP is going out because it's just a procedure that they have to do, but the deal's already been done and mm -hmm. we don't know that either. So what you're trying to do, like I'm just to get to the point is during the negotiation, it's really about gathering information. Yeah, absolutely. And, and validating your assumptions, right? You, mm -hmm. You're for sure going to have to try your very best to make the most educated guess you can about their, their position and their interests in the mm -hmm. negotiation. 
but you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't try and validate those assumptions. Right. And I also um, like very much what you're saying about not only preparation, but also the practice part, because a lot of times conceptually we have the information in our head and it's not rocket science. It's like, of course, but what we don't have is we haven't transitioned it down from our head and internalized it so that what comes out of our mouth really is something that we want to come out of our mouths. So yeah. what you don't want to do, and I get it, it doesn't mean that you have to have a pat answer for everything. It doesn't mean you're going to be super articulate in every moment, but it does mean that you have to have some stock phrases that even buy you time if you do get flustered or that open up. So you're talking about probing questions. So what I think, and I also recommend and do is in a negotiation, I have one or two probing questions prepared for any situation. They're just generic. Like, can you tell me more what you mean by, and then whatever it is that they, and this gives me time to maybe deal with my emotional reaction to things, deal yeah. with maybe being caught off guard or just, you know, just to buy time and sort of, and then to get more information, level the field. So you can't always have that ready if you haven't practiced and been in a situation because you don't know what's going to come out of your mouth. That's right. And if you think you're going to remember before going in, you're sadly mistaken because you're going to get caught up in the emotion of the negotiation and you're going to forget. Mm -hmm. And it's my job as the counterparty to help you to forget. <laughs> right. And to get you as flustered as I can, get you to sign that deal and walk away and say, what have I done? Well, yeah. Or just basically agree with everything that I'm saying as a matter of fact, when in fact it may just be opinion. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, buyer's remorse and you go home and you say, why do I have that red sports car in my driveway? <laughs> so I'm just going to read a question here and then we'll deal with these. So one question is, what are some techniques to contain the heat in a negotiation when party perceptions and unfounded assumptions cloud the path to an orderly negotiation process? So it's really about the whole emotional component in a negotiation. Yeah, great question. So there's, there's a lot of negotiation instructors and authors that will teach you um, to separate emotion from a negotiation. And in my opinion, that's BS. You're, you're not going to be able to do that. And every one of us has a different way of being able to manage their own emotions. The key here is to remember that you are emotional. Um, and you may not like to hear that, but we are emotional beings and we get caught up in the emotion of the deal uh, at many points in times. And so when that heat comes along, it's really, really important. What, when you start to recognize yourself being caught up in that type of a negotiation is to slow it way down. Don't get caught up in the heat. Don't get caught up in the emotion of it. Check yourself, slow down. If you need to take a step out of the room, Take a step out of the room. If you need to call them back, call them back. No one's going to get mad at you for taking time out to make a good decision. Just take the time that you need to slow it down and remember where you are and what it is you're doing, which is why preparation is so important. So you can actually go back, check your notes, check your framework, understand where you actually are in the negotiation, understand your BATNA, whether or not you're being influenced by fact or opinion, and then go back into the negotiation. But it comes down to, a lot of it comes down to self-awareness, um, and that only comes through practice. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on what you're saying, is that we don't realize how fast everything happens, and slowing things down may feel really slow to us, but it's a really necessary pause. And the idea of stepping away is you, what you're also doing in that action is you're breaking the rhythm the other person yes. has established. And so the other person's got you in a little bit of a tailspin. And so if you just don't slow down, you just react immediately and then you say, oh no, what have I done? And so being able to break the pattern or break that rhythm is really important because when you take that pause and you leave and then come back into it, then you're coming back with a fresh start. So that's really that's good. Right. Okay, we have another question here. Greetings from Uruguay. What happens when you make concessions now to get something in the future? Does that work? Uh, 
This is a really good question. So I get, I, I actually get asked this question a lot. So what you're essentially doing is, is you're, you're putting a lot of trust in that person to reciprocate. And I mean, there's a lot of studies that have been done over the power of reciprocity. Um, and if you do something for someone, they're significantly more likely to recipro uh, uh, be to reciprocate the favor back to you. I, and, and, and yet <laughs> I am very cautious about what I am willing to concede uh, if I'm not getting something of equal or greater value in return in the negotiation that we're having. Because by making, for example, a supplier making a price concession uh, based on the promise of potential future work, that very rarely comes to pass. I would almost have something in writing at that point that allows you to, to go back to. Um, I, I understand that there's a bunch of theories around reciprocity that make a lot of sense. I'm not a hundred percent sold on that. So I, I would just say, use your best judgment there. And, and if you're going to trust someone, just make sure that they are trustworthy. Um, remember people are operating, uh, for other businesses, not necessarily for themselves. So you can't really blame the person. If that doesn't work out, you, you can blame the organization, but they're just filling their role. So just be very wary about where you place your trust in the negotiation. Yeah, I'm also thinking about when people accommodate to others because yeah. they think it buys a better relationship. So um, that's an assumption, right? And that whole dialogue has taken place in your own head that if I do this now, he'll do this later, when in actuality, if you don't have that commitment. So I still do sometimes err on the side of being able to uh, do, do some kind of concession. But then this goes to something else you said earlier, Mark, about the whole preparation and what are you willing to give up? So in that preparation part and what are you willing to give up, you know what concessions you're willing to make that would be less harmful to you than some serious concessions. So if doing something, giving up a concession that's not that bad for you, but buys a better relationship and develops that kind of rapport, then that's okay. But I wouldn't give a concession that's really serious when you have no commitment for future engagement. Yeah, you've got to get that commitment. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question is, do you think it's useful to ask the source for facts when the other negotiator is making bold assumptions? Uh, Great question and yes. So for example, if a sales, if you're negotiating with a sales organization of um, a company that you're, is the other party, the counterparty, and that counterparty says, you know, we're the best provider of widget X, your very first response should be, it sounds like you're prepared to provide data to support that claim. Mm -hmm. Don't just take what they say as face value because their job is to sell and that's not their fault. I mean, that's their job, but they need to be willing to provide data to support those statements. Otherwise it has to be anecdotal or you've got to be the one that has to go and then validate whether or not that statement is correct. Is it factual? So yes, I absolutely would say provide data to support that statement. And the way you're saying it, Mark, is that you're not saying it to the other side, show me, prove it to me. It's not a threat. It's just, okay, that's a pretty bold statement. Do you have some data to support Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. And it, and it could be phrased as a question, right? So mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing that information. I didn't know that you were the number one. Perhaps you could share with me um, some data to support that. As you know, I'm learning about this process as well. And you could always almost take the Columbo approach to that <laughs> and get them to answer the question for you. Um, and then you've caught, you've caught them basically in a situation where they've, they've lied to you um, and you've caught them in a lie, but you haven't accused them of lying, which is a fun situation to be in. Yeah. So just for people who may not know who Columbo is, it was a television program with Peter Falk as the main actor of Columbo. And he looked like a fumbling detective, but he was very, very skillful in getting the information he wanted. And he always managed to get the person who did it to confess. 
Okay, another question. What are the best techniques to make good practice? Is it something possible within the working environment with colleagues or should it be tested before stepping in? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I definitely think you need to be practicing this with your colleagues within your department. Um, and, and if anyone's been in the military, there's, there's a concept called red teaming as well. So you could practice with friendly people in your department and then bring in um, someone who's maybe designated as the person who's just going to be a jerk in the negotiation and practice it with that, with that person who's been assigned to be the jerk because it's important that you understand where your weak spots are in your negotiation and you're only going to find that out if you get someone who's going to push your hot buttons and get you into a situation where you're going to get flustered, where you're going to get red faced, where you're going to get offended. That's really important to know where your limits are so that you can know before going into the negotiation where you may need to stay, take a step back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about a time when um, I was coaching somebody and also preparing the person for having a negotiation with her boss. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, when you talked also, Mark, earlier about self-awareness, we have an opinion and a perception of how we are and how we show up and how people perceive us, but then actually doing the practice session and actually saying what they're going to say with all of the mannerisms and the nonverbal communication could have a very different impact than they thought they had, right? So then I was able to give her feedback basically because I, I knew who her boss was and I was able to say, well, here's how I saw what you were doing and here's the impact it had on me and I'm trying to speak from the position of your boss. So um, is that what you intended? And then she realized, well, no, that's not what I intended. Here's my intention. I said, okay, so we have to work on techniques to align your intention with what you wanted to happen in that interaction, that negotiation, with the impact that it actually had. And so, you know, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall at the real negotiation to see what really happened, but at least we went through that process. So I definitely encourage people to practice with people who they trust will give them that honest feedback and not just gloss over and say, oh, yeah, 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 that was great when actually it wasn't. Yeah, and it's very important you brought up a really good point, Beth, is your, your nonverbal communication is significantly, it communicates significantly more than the actual words that are being said, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a bunch of studies that have been done on the percentage of nonverbal communication to overall communication, but anywhere between 65 and 93% of your communication, depending on the study that you read, is nonverbal, which means everything other than the words that you're using and your body does things that you don't realize they're doing right. If you read any of Paul Ekman's work on micro expressions, your face gives away so much in a discussion and a negotiation that we don't realize that the other party is just naturally attuned to because we are human beings. And so if the other party is reading a certain expression on your face that doesn't correlate to the words that you're saying, then, then they're getting different information than you want them to get. And so you really, that's why it's so important to practice, right? I mean, if you think of poker, that's why poker players wear the glasses and their hats over their faces and they're trying their very best not to breathe heavily because all of that information is communicated in split seconds to the other party about what our actual intentions are. Yeah, that's a good point. And I'm thinking also it has to do with trust. So if your verbal message is not consistent with your nonverbal message, it sends mixed signals, as you said, and then it causes sometimes the other person not to trust you because they're thinking, well, I'm getting some mixed messages here. What's the real story? Okay, now we have a comment and then we have another question. A comment is, thank you. I learned concession can lend itself to asking for more concessions. Yeah, 100% correct. Mm -hmm. And then somebody from the Gambia said, um, must a negotiation be win-win? Good question. So it, it really depends on what your objectives are. If if it's a tactical purchase that you make all the time and there's a bunch of competition in the marketplace and it's 
basically a commodity based product that you can buy from anyone, then there's really no incentive for you to develop a long term relationship with that party because all they're really doing is providing a, a commodity to you, for example, right? So if I was going to buy work gloves, I can buy work gloves from 50 different companies all over the world and they're all going to be price competitive. So, and I, I really don't have to have a great relationship with that company because all they're doing to me is providing that work glove. And if it's something that's strategic, that requires me to have a long-term relationship where I rely upon something over a long period of time, or I want to develop that relationship so that I can get something further from them, or we can do business in the future that's beneficial, then I would suggest that having something that's beneficial for both parties is is it's just mutually advantageous, right? I think win-win is an overused term, to be honest with you. And I, I think it's, there's, there's going to be a party in a negotiation that gets more than the other party. So win-win is sort of, it's misleading. I would, I would view it as something that's mutually beneficial. And I know that sounds like a cop-out answer, <laughs> but, but terminology I think is really, really important because no one's going to be, you know, you're not going to get an equal separation of value in the negotiation. It's just unlikely to happen, but you are going to get something that's mutually beneficial for both parties. So yeah, there's going to probably be someone who's going to get some more of something out of the negotiation than the other party. And that's fine. As long as the other party got something out of it as well that they viewed as beneficial. Mm hmm yeah, just one other comment I have about that is in my long years of experience here is just thinking that you think you're not going to have an interaction with somebody else and you think it's going to be a one off, but there are two ways that person comes back in your life at some point. One is the actual person could come back because sometimes people move jobs and you may end up in a different situation, not thinking you're going to see person X and suddenly there's person X. So you want to make sure what was my last encounter like with this person? Do they still like me? Because you want to have a good relationship. And the second is if there are certain kinds of behaviors or attitudes that get under your skin that are triggers for you not to be your best self, then those kinds of people with those kinds of behaviors are going to keep reappearing in your life. So it's also a message for you to say, okay, you know what? I really need to deal with this kind of behavior. So let me pay attention to it now. Yeah. So um, we're just about out of time. I just wanted to say thank you, Mark, so much for taking us on a journey here through B2B negotiation. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Beth. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say thank you to everybody to listen. And I think Andy might say a word or two about when the recording will become available. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to extend a big thank you to both Mark and Beth for particip participating in our webinar. Um, the webinar will be recorded or has been recorded and will be available online. Um, should you have any other questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to provide them to you. Um, thank you to Mark today, along with the Negotiation and Resolution Program for sharing such a great presentation and uh, helping us to prepare for today's event. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day, guys.